Hello and welcome back to Neural Data Science. I'm Professor Aaron Newman. Today we're going to learn about plotting with the Seaborn package in Python. Our learning objectives are to become familiar with use cases for Seaborn plots, to generate a variety of plots in Seaborn useful for exploratory data analysis, to understand the advantages and disadvantages of different types of plots in Seaborn, to recognize and appropriately use strategies for visualizing continuous and categorical data, and to visualize and reason about distributions of data. So Seaborn is a great Python plotting package that's built on top of matplotlib. That is, it uses matplotlib under the hood, but it offers users a much simpler API, in other words, a set of commands, that enables us to generate a variety of great looking plots that are particularly useful in data science. You can check out Seaborn's examples gallery, linked here, to see some of the cool stuff you can do, including plotting neuroscience data. Seaborn was written by Michael Wascom. Comparing Seaborn to matplotlib, you could say that matplotlib gives you every sharp, hard to use tool in the shed, and you have to figure out how to learn them all without chopping off a finger. Fortunately, in data science, you aren't likely to lose any fingers, but Seaborn gives you some DIY-friendly power tools to get data science jobs done easily and looking great. So in this figure, which is from the Seaborn website, you can see an overview of three primary Seaborn plotting functions. There's relplot for relational plots to show relationships between two different continuous variables. And then we have displot for distributions, which are things like histograms that we've seen previously and other kinds of plots like kernel density estimates that also allow us to view the distributions of values of continuous data. And then finally, catplot for plotting categorical data. This includes strip plots, swarm plots, box plots, violin plots, point plots, and bar plots. And we'll go through all of these in this lesson. And importantly, with categorical data, typically we have some mixture of categorical and continuous data. So the catplot functions allow us to plot variables that are categorical, um, but may also have a range of values. So for example, we might have two different experimental conditions, which would be two different categories. Uh, but in each experimental condition, we measure reaction time, which is a continuous variable. So catplot allows us to plot relationships between categorical and continuous variables. So the first thing we have to do is import Seaborn. And so we'll type import Seaborn. And the conventional alias that we use for Seaborn is SNS. We're going to need some other packages. So we'll import pandas as pd. We'll import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And we'll need glob, so let's import that as well. Run that, okay. Next, we're gonna start by plotting the gapminder data because we've seen this data in previous lessons and we used it in the matplotlib lesson. So we're gonna show you how the same data get plotted in Seaborn and we can compare how they look when we plot them with matplotlib. So for this, we're gonna use df equals, we're gonna import the Oceania data uh, for GDP so pd.read underscore csv it's in the data subfolder and it's called gapminder underscore gdp underscore oceania dot csv and we want the index column to be the countries and then we're going to rename the columns so here we say df columns and note that we don't use parentheses here. I'll just make a, a sort of a side note about this. This kind of looks like a method, right? So you see the name of the data frame dot and then something after it. If it was a method, we'd add parentheses after that uh, to specify the arguments. Even if there are no arguments, it'd be empty parentheses. Columns are properties of objects. So df here is a pandas data frame object and it has certain properties like the columns are the names of the columns as well it has like a shape so the number of rows and the number of columns those properties you refer to just with a dot and then the name of the property no parentheses so they're different from methods even though the, the syntax looks somewhat familiar and we're going to assign new names to the columns and that's going to come from taking the existing names so df.columns we're going to pass that through the string.strip method and the argument to that is the characters that we want to strip. So GDP per cap underscore. 
because that's at the start of every column name followed by the year, and we want to just isolate the year as the names of the columns. And I'll say df.head after that, just so we can see when we run it that indeed it worked, and those are the column names now, just the years. In the previous lesson, we plotted GDP for each country as a function of year. So year on the x-axis, GDP on the y-axis, and separate lines for each country. As we discussed previously, in this data set, year is a continuous variable, as is GDP, but country is a categorical variable. From the figure of seaborne plot types above, you can see that rel plot is the function to use for relational plots. That is, when you want to show the relationships between two continuous variables, so in this case, year and GDP. Also remember that these data are in wide format, meaning the continuous variable of year actually goes across columns. We need to not just pass df to sns, so let's say sns.relplot, and then data equals, so with Seaborn we always have a data equals to tell it what data source to use. And here we're going to say df.t, capital T, which means transpose, so we swap the rows and columns. And the kind of plot, this is another standard Seaborn quark, is a line plot. So this will plot separate lines for each of our categories, each of our countries. plt.show has the final line in a plot window or a plot cell. And there you go. So you can see we have separate lines for Australia and New Zealand. Seaborn nicely color codes them and also changes the line styles for each one to make them very visually distinct. We've got GDP on the y-axis year on the x-axis. It's not great, and it's not great because those years are overlapping. We probably don't need every year represented there on the x-axis. And also, x and y have these underscore x and underscore y labels on them, which actually come from transposing the data. So Seaborn really is sort of designed to work primarily with long format data, although it does work with wide format data as well. And just for comparison, let's look at what happens when we do the same plot using matplotlib. So here we're going to do df.transpose.plot. So we're using pandas.plot method, which by default gives us a line plot. And it's calling matplotlib behind the scenes, even though it's a method for pandas. And then plt.show. And there you have it. So again, it's color coding the lines. We get a nice legend. In this case, matplotlib actually does a better job in the sense that the x-axis is a lot cleaner, the numbers aren't overlapping, it's selected just every 10 years uh, for the axis labels, and we don't have labels of underscore y and underscore x. But as we go through, you'll see that in many cases, Seaborn actually generates at least as clean a plot and much more easily. So for the rest of the lesson, we're going to work with lawn format data. And we're going to use some data that I have made up. So it's, it's just synthesized data, but it's made uh, to represent reaction time data from a simple lexical decision task. So a lexical decision task is a pretty common task in psycholinguistics, where you present participants with a series of words and letter strings. Letter string just being like a string in Python, a sequence of characters. So on each trial, the participant sees a word on the screen, they have to press one button if it's a real word in the language that they know, or the other button if it's not a real word. And typically, the non-words are designed to look similar to real words. So in English, they might be words like blorp or fertile. You can see the spelling down there, fertile, not F-E-R, but F-U-R, more like turtle. The dependent variable in these experiments is reaction time, the amount of time that passes between the onset of the word on the screen and the button press. Lexical decision tasks are often used in psycholinguistics to explore properties of the real words. So among the real words, there might be variation in, say, how frequently they occur in the language or their, their spelling or some other property of them. Here, we're not interested in that so much as just the fact that, as well, when you see a non-word, in general, you're slower to respond. And this is thought to be because when you see a non-word, especially if it looks kind of like a real word, your brain spends more time trying to search through all the words you know to verify that it is not actually a word you know before you make that button press. Anyway, the, the basic description of the data then is that we have reaction times from two conditions, words and non-words, and we expect that the reaction times will be slower to the non-words than to the words. Okay, so we have data from five hypothetical participants, each stored in a separate data file inside the data folder. 
So the first thing we're going to do is read all of these in and concatenate them into one large pandas data frame. We've seen how to do this before, and here I'm going to do it in one line of code. So I'm going to assign the results to df, so this will replace the df that I created up above for the Oceania data. And we're going to run pd.concat on a list of pandas data frames. We're going to create that list of pandas data frames with a list comprehension. So inside my arguments for pd.concat, I have one argument, which is going to be a list, formerly a list comprehension, and that's going to be pd.read underscore csv f for f. So f is my loop variable in glob.glob. .glob. So we're going to pull out the file names based on matching the string, which is data slash the name of the folder where the data are ldt, which is how all of the files start, underscore s, typo, there we go. And then all of the data files are s followed by two numbers, which are the subject ID number. So we're going to match question mark, question mark, which means match exactly two characters following the s, any characters, underscore data dot csv. And I'm going to give pd.concat a second argument, which is ignore underscore index equals true. And this is a good argument to get in the habit of using when you're concatenating a list of data frames. The reason is that each data frame, when you import it, gets indexed starting from zero, because we're not specifying an index column. In these data, we don't really have an index column. And so each one's indexed starting at zero, and each row just has a, an incrementally larger zero, one, two, three kind of number. But when we concatenate them together, that means that there are multiple rows that have an index of zero and multiple rows that have an index of one and so on because each individual's data file had one row where the index was zero. This causes some confusion later on, especially for Seaborn. So ignore index equals true tells pandas to ignore the indexes in the files when you're concatenating them and essentially re-index the file uh, so that each row has a unique index. So we've run that. And then just to confirm it ran and see what the data looks like, we're going to say df.sample to ask for 10 random rows out of the data frame. And there you can see now we have the ID column, which is the uh, participant ID. We have condition, which is either word or non-word, and reaction time, RT, in seconds, floating point values. All right, so we're going to look at plots pretty soon. But first, let's run some descriptive statistics using the df.describe method and just see what we have. So we have 250 data points total. Mean reaction time is 0.6938 approximately seconds. Standard deviation of 0.155. And you can see the min max and quartiles there as well. So these tables, you can make some inferences about the distribution of the data, but it's much easier to do so visually based on a histogram. So let's see how to generate a histogram in Seaborn. Well, we use the sns.displot function. Remember, this is for looking at distributions of data. And we'll give it two quarks, one being data equals df. Seaborn always needs data to plot. And we're going to tell it that rt is on the x-axis. We don't need to tell it what's on the y-axis because a histogram will necessarily plot the number of items in each bin, the number of data points in each bin, on the y-axis. The other thing you'll note is that although up above, you may remember that displot had a number of different types of plots in it, including histograms, kernel density estimates, and others. We don't have to specify that if we want a histogram because that's the default for sns.displot. And then run plt.show. And there you go. So we have a lovely histogram with reaction time on the x-axis. You can see the distribution of values. Looks pretty normally distributed which is actually not surprising. It's surprising if you think of real reaction time data, but because I generated these using a random number generator, they are going to be approximately normally distributed. And they're really, today, the point is just to have some data to look at plots, not to have it be sort of realistic in terms of what RT data might look like. And you can see Seaborn generates a nice plot by default. And in contrast to the Gapminder one that we saw before, we actually automatically get appropriate labels for our x and y axes, whereas in matplotlib, we'd have to add additional uh, commands in order to add those labels. And it's done a good job of not overlapping the tick marks and the numbers on those tick marks. 
So we can see that this is a nice distribution of values. Seaborn does a good job of automatically picking the number of bins to characterize the data appropriately. Maybe a slight skew here, but it's pretty normally distributed. Seaborn also makes it easy to tweak different properties of the plots. So in this case, although I said the number of bins by default was, was pretty good, we can change that and we can also change the color quite easily just using quarks. So sns.ds dis plot data equals df x equals rt comma and then just to make the code more readable I'm going to hit enter go to a new line so that the next quarg is on another line because if you have a whole bunch of quarks on one line it gets busy and a little hard to find a particular one and then on the final line color equals red and then finally plt.show, run that. And surprise, surprise, we get a red histogram because we said color equals red. And we can also see that going up to 25 bins is maybe a bit too fine grained. So before the data looked fairly normally distributed, now they, they still have that general trend, but like there's one bar here that's particularly low, a little more bumpy. Uh, in general, you probably want to stick with the default number of bins for a histogram when using Seaborn. So when we're plotting histograms, the default is to plot the count, so the number of data points in each bin. And the bin width, as I said before, is computed automatically by Seaborn and, and usually in a, a sensible way. But sometimes plotting the absolute count of values on the y-axis isn't the best choice, especially if you want to compare distributions of data where you're concerned about, you know, are they normal? Are they skewed? How do they compare? How much do they overlap? But you know that there's a different number of trials in each condition, for example. So you might have a number of different conditions. And for some reason, like sometimes you have a control condition that has more trials than each of several experimental conditions. So the sum of trials across the experimental conditions, say you had three experimental conditions and one control condition. If you want an equal number in total of trials in the two conditions, you might have 10 trials in each of the three experimental conditions for a total of 30, and then 30 control trials. So in that case, a histogram that plots the absolute number of trials in each bin is going to make it look like there's a lot more trials in the control condition because there are. So if you want to sort of scale the heights of the histograms appropriately, regardless of how many trials or data points are in that particular condition, what you can do is normalize the data in some way. So by normalizing, we mean we're scaling the data to some standard sort of maximum value or average value. So for example, here we can use stat equals probability with SNS displot, and that'll make the histograms bar height sum to one for each condition that we're plotting. Right now we're only plotting one condition. Uh, so SNS.displot data equals DF x equals rt, stat equals probability, and then plt.show, of course. Okay, so the histogram looks the same as the first one in the sense that the color is the same, the shape, the distribution of values is the same. What's different is the y-axis is now probability rather than count. And you can see the maximum probability is 0.16, that means 16%. So 16% approximately of the data are in this middle bin, so the most values. In total, if you summed up the heights of all of these bins, they would sum to one. So basically the height of each bin tells you what proportion of the total number of trials or data points uh, is in that particular bin. So it's a more standardized way of looking at the data. If we scroll back, just for reference, again, the y-axis in the original histogram by default is just the count. So there's 40 trials, that comprises about 16% of the data. Um, but you can see that, you can imagine that if the total number of trials in different conditions was different and you were plotting different conditions on one histogram, then it would be harder to interpret. We can also look at distributions using plots other than histograms. And the one that I'm gonna show you today is the kernel density estimate. So it's like a histogram, but rather than plotting sort of bins and basically discretizing your data from a continuous range into a set of bins, the KDE gives you a continuous uh, distribution plot. Uh, so it's another kind of normalization, but rather than making the heights of the bars sum to one, 
the kernel density estimate makes the area under the smoothed curve equal to one. So it's scaling the data and it would make the data, the heights of the histograms more comparable if you had different counts of, of data in different conditions. It's just a different way of doing it. Another thing to point out is that whereas histograms literally point and plot the number of data points in each bin, KDEs are estimates of the true distribution. Uh, they're effectively smoothed, and so they're slightly less accurate representations of the data. They're essentially models that predict what the true distribution of data would be if more data was collected. So in practice, when you look at histograms and KDEs, as you'll see in a minute when I finally plot one, they're pretty similar and likely you're going to derive the same kinds of conclusions from both. But it's worth mentioning this distinction because it's one we'll come back to again and again and pretty important consideration in data science. To what extent are you literally plotting the data and to what extent are you plotting a model based on the data that sort of generalizes and maybe even makes predictions about what future data would look like. Okay, so to get a kernel density estimate, we say sns.displot, uh, but this time, instead of letting it use the default, we specify kind as equal to KDE. And then the other parameters are the same, so data equals df and x equals rt. plt.show, run that. And I made a typo. There we go. Okay, so again, you can see this has sort of a normal-ish distribution shape, similar to the histograms we saw above. It's based on the same data, so that's not surprising. But instead of the bins, you see this continuous smooth line. It's a little bit bumpy, so it's not a perfectly normal distribution. There's some random sampling going on, but it's approximately like that. And that little bump or shoulder, we might call it, you can sort of see it in the histogram. But again, the KDE is representing the data slightly differently and sort of abstracting to get that smooth line as opposed to, to bins. Density plots arguably make a bit more sense for continuous variables like reaction time, since reaction time can vary continuously. So we're sort of artificially discretizing it by plotting the histogram. But again, either way, you can see that the distribution of values is the distribution of values. How you plot it is just a little different, but you're going to essentially derive the same conclusions probably from looking at a, a KDE or a histogram. Okay, so those were basic instructions on how to generate a histogram or uh, another kind of distribution plot with Seaborn. Of course, in this study, our data have two conditions. We have words and non-words, and it would make sense to look at the distribution of values in those two conditions separately. So we can do that using the pandas.groupby uh, method to get first descriptive statistics. So this is the, the sort of split apply combine approach of saying we're going to split the data by grouping it by condition, and then we're going to apply the describe method. And the combine is going to happen sort of magically in generating the output. So we can see we get output for RT. That's the only continuous variable in the pandas data frame that we could get descriptive statistics for. And two different conditions, non-word and word, 125 data points in each. Different mean reaction times, clearly slower in the non-word condition than the word condition by about 200 milliseconds. And similar standard deviations and the other values there. Now, when we use Seaborn, we don't actually have to use the pandas.groupby. We can just use the quarg that tells Seaborn to plot different conditions in, in this case, different colors. So we can use hue as the quarg here. So sns.displot data equals df, x equals rt, and hue equals condition and then plt.show. There you have it. So now we have the distribution of values in the word condition in blue and the non-word condition in orange, and the overlap between them is shown in gray. So just by using the hue keyword and telling it to use different hues or different colors for different conditions, 
Seaborn did that split apply combine kind of operation for us. Seaborn does a lot of other nice things automatically as well. It gives us a legend with meaningful labels. And again, the axes are labeled well as well. If you don't like the default colors that Seaborn uses, it's quite easy to change those. Up above, we saw how we could manually specify a color. But when you have multiple conditions, you're using the hue, quarg, or there's some other ways of, of determining colors in a Seaborn plot. We can use a color palette, which means Seaborn already has a set of colors that it's going to choose from in sequence. So you may have already inferred that the first condition or line or distribution or whatever Seaborn plots, it plots in blue. And the second one, it plots in orange. We saw that above in the line plots for the Gapminder data. And we see it here in the histogram as well. We can see the set of colors that SNS will use by using the command sns.color underscore palette. And so you can see blue and orange as the first two colors, then green, red, and so on. So if we had four conditions, they would show as blue, orange, then green, then red. If we had five, it would be purple, etc., etc. Seaborn has a number of color palettes built in, and there are documentation on their website about what the names of those are, so you can easily find that. Um, and one of the nice things is that they include uh, different color palettes for that are more viewable by people with color blindness, and also one I'll show you here, which is the paired color palette, sns.color underscore palette. And then I just give it the name of the palette I want to view. And the nice thing about the paired palette, as the name suggests, is it's for data when you have pairs of conditions. So in this case, it'll plot the first two conditions in light blue, dark blue, the second set in light green, dark green, etc., etc. So if you have data that naturally sort of lend themselves to pairing, you can use the paired uh, color palette. And this is how you would do it. So we're going to plot our histogram again with the two conditions. SNS does displot data equals df, x equals rt. And as I said before, it's nice to break a line into multiple lines to make the quargs a little easier to see. Hue equals condition. And palette equals paired. Finally, plt.show. There you have it. So in this case where we only have two conditions, the paired color palette is maybe not the best choice. It's really when you want to show that there's you've got multiple conditions, but pairings so that people would sort of naturally associate the light blue and the dark blue together, and then the light blue green and the dark green together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In this case, it actually kind of minimizes the differences between the two conditions. They're a lot less distinct than the blue and orange. And in particular, the area of overlap, the shading there is very subtly different from especially the non-word shading. So maybe not the best choice. And sometimes you do want to play around with different color palettes to get one that really optimizes the contrast or the, you know, tells the story that you want the data to tell. We can do this for the KDE plots as well. So just to show that, sns.displot kind equals KDE, data equals DF. In this case, I'm going to put X on the next line with RT and also hue because that's another quarg that refers to data points and how to sort of split and represent the data. Condition. And then I'll show you the colorblind palette. plt.show. And oh, so this is a nice little teachable moment. It wasn't intentional. But you can see that it's telling me I have an error on line four, palette equals colorblind. There's nothing actually wrong with the syntax of that. And this is one of those errors that can give you some trouble until you learn to look for the right things. The problem is I didn't put a comma after hue equals condition. So without that comma, Seaborn doesn't really know what to do with the palette quarg because it's still sort of thinking that it's looking for input to, to what is hue equal to. Obviously the error message itself is not terribly diagnostic, except 
it, we know that the error was encountered at palette, so you kind of work backwards from there and see, oh, I missed that comma. So let's run that again, and there you go. Now we have a kernel density estimate with two different conditions. It's using the colorblind palette, which is not that different from the default Seaborn palette. The colors are, are maybe a little less faded. And if you look at the Seaborn documentation, they actually have some simulations of what their different color palettes look like with different kinds of colorblindness. And the hues in the colorblind palette are just a little more different from each other so that they're more distinct to people with colorblindness. However, they're maybe a little less distinct to people without colorblindness. Not, not a lot different, um, but that's why they don't use the colorblind palette by default. Okay, so that's uh, coverage of distribution plots. Now we're going to talk about categorical plots. Histograms and kernel density estimates are used to visualize the distribution of continuous variables, like RT in our example data set. We can also plot categorical variables by drawing different histograms or KDEs for each category, like word versus non-word in the plots above. These plots are useful for visualizing the shape of the distributions of data, which is an important first step in working with data because some ways of treating data, especially statistical tests like t-tests and ANOVAs, actually assume a certain shape of the data. So for t-tests and ANOVAs, they assume that the data are normally distributed, the classic bell curve. And those statistical tests like t-tests and ANOVAs may not work as well or accurately on data that have very different distributions. On the other hand, in those cases, other approaches to analyzing the data could be more appropriate. So once we understand the distribution of the data, however, we might want to focus more on assessing whether there are differences between different categories, such as different experimental conditions or different groups. And that's where Seaborn's cat plot family of plots comes into play. And some of these cat plots actually do show the distribution quite nicely, maybe not in as much detail as a histogram or a KDE, but in a way that actually allows you to see both the distribution of data and compare the means of the data to get a sense of are they, are they really that different or not. So cat plot has six different plotting options as shown in the figure at the top of this lesson. Uh, all of them allow us to view the distribution of data, but in different ways, and some of them focus more on certain features of the data or another. One that's uh, very classically used and I like a lot is the box plot. Sometimes these are called box and whisker plots. So the box in a box and whisker plot, as you're seeing here, this one's horizontal, the box itself shows the interquartile range, which is the range between the 25th and 75th percentiles of the data. In other words, half the data falls within the box. So just by looking at a box plot, you can see that 50% you know, of the data lie in the range covered by that box. And I like this figure down below, which comes from Wikipedia, which shows a box plot on top of a normal distribution. So you can kind of map those two things together and think about how the box plot relates to something like a KDE, uh, at least if your data are truly normally distributed. So you can see here the shaded area under the, the curve is 50%. That matches our interquartile range, our box. Uh, the whiskers in the box plot, so these lines that extend out on either side and end in these vertical lines, those represent the first quartile, so 25th percentile, minus 1.5 times the interquartile range, so that 1.5 times the width of that box. That may sound a little arbitrary, but basically what that does is capture approximately another 25% of the data. And likewise, on, on the other side, it's the third quartile or the 75th percentile plus 1.5 times IQR. So in other words, those whiskers extend out to sort of the other 25% of the data on either side, such that almost, now it's not 25, it's 24.65, almost all of the data fall within the span of the whiskers. So that really gives you a sense of sort of the bulk of the data, what's the real range of data. And sometimes the ends of the whiskers are called the min and max. Now they're not the true minimum and maximum values in the data set, but they're sort of estimates of, on average, what would we expect as sort of reasonable guesses for the minimum and maximum values in data like this, say if we were to collect data again. What you're not seeing here is any data points that do fall outside of those whiskers. So again, that's 50% plus 24.65 on each side, leaves us with a small fraction of the data not covered by that range. Those are considered outliers and they'd be represented as dots outside. So each outlier data point would be a dot outside of the whiskers. 
And then finally, the bar inside the box represents the median, so the value that's sort of at the center of the distribution of values, or the, the 50th percentile, or the second quartile. All right, so that's a little bit about box plots. Now let's actually draw one with Seaborn. So we'll use sns.catplot, kind equals box, and then everything else is going to be somewhat familiar, data equals df. Except here, what I want is I want to plot condition on the x-axis. So in other words, on the horizontal axis of the plot, we're going to have one spot for the word condition and one spot for the non-word condition, and we're going to plot a separate box plot for each. So x equals condition, and then y equals rt. So each box plot is going to show the range of values of rt along the y-axis and separate boxes to show those ranges for each of our two conditions. And of course, we end with plt.show. So there you have it. Now, as I said, word and non-word are two separate conditions, categories on the x-axis, rt is on the y-axis, and we can see our boxes with the median as the bar in the middle, the square, the box representing the interquartile range, and then the whiskers representing roughly the sort of min and max values. In this case, we don't have any outliers. Um, not totally surprising because these data were generated with a random number generator to have certain properties and not to include outliers. The other thing you can see from this right away is that we've got two different conditions. We expected reaction times for non-words to be slower than for words. And indeed they are, in fact, by a pretty wide margin. Um, so we can see the distribution of values here, but we can also start to make inferences about similarities or differences between conditions. Of course, you can do that with histograms, but box plots make it uh, a little easier to determine sort of the, the magnitude of the difference. So box plots are a nice go-to for categorical plots to show differences or similarities between conditions along with properties of their distributions. Another way of doing this is with violin plots. A violin plot is in some ways the best of both worlds because you actually get essentially a kernel density estimate plot plus a box plot all in one. So let's see what that looks like, sns.catplot. And this will all be the same as the previous command except for kind equals violin instead of box. Data equals df, x equals condition, y equals rt, and plt.show. Okay. Now the reality is these don't look like violins. And if your data actually looked like a violin, you should be very suspicious because violins are sort of wide at the top and the bottom and pinched in the middle. So these are kind of the opposite of violins. Um, my kid Salem likes to call them stingray plots. I like that name, but the rest of the world has not yet caught on. So violin plots it is. So what you can see is the box plot is inside the stingray, or the, the blob, the violin, whatever we want to call it. It's a little bit reduced compared to the box plots we saw before, but the, the white dot is the median. The thicker black area is the interquartile range, and then the whiskers are the thinner lines extending out from that. But then around that is the kernel density estimate from each condition, and that's symmetrical on either side. There are cases where you could actually tell Seaborn to show different KDEs on each side if you had data like within words and non-words, if we had some subcategories, we could show two different distributions there, which is actually kind of cool and powerful. We don't have that complexity of data here, but anyway, you can see there's the box plot inside the kernel density estimate. So kind of nice, best of both worlds, although sometimes it distracts you from the details of the box plot by seeing the big distribution plot. Often a matter of personal preference, which kind of plot you choose. Next, we're gonna look at strip and swarm plots. These are very similar to each other. And again, they're cat plots and they're ways of looking at how the data are distributed in different categories. So sns.catplot kind equals strip. Uh, rest is going to be the same, data equals df, x equals condition, y equals rt, and finally plt.show. 
So you can see here what's happening is rather than sort of generalizing and showing a box plot or a distribution like a histogram or a KDE, we actually get every data point represented as a dot and the distribution of values is shown there. So you can sort of see there's a denser distribution of values sort of in the middle of the cl cloud or whatever we want to call it, the strip, I guess and then a fewer, fewer number of data points uh, out at the tails. So that's consistent with the normal distribution. Now, if you have lots of data points in the middle, they'll tend to overlap. Seaborn's sort of spreading them out laterally so you can see that they aren't, you know, even when they overlap, there's a, a bit of a difference. But the swarm plot sort of accentuates the differences, so makes the, the plots wider, especially where there's more data points. So sns.catplot kind equals swarm, rest is the same, data equals df, x equals condition, y equals rt, and plt.show. So again, you can see the swarm, it's, it's like the strip, except it gets wider to prevent overlap of dots, so you can get a better sense of how many data points there actually are at different locations along your y-axis. Some people like swarm plots and strip plots because the box plots necessarily generalize and sort of you lose detailed information, whereas this literally shows you every data point in your data set. On the other hand, if you have a very large data set, these can get very messy very quickly. If we had thousands of data points in each condition, these would be quite uh, kind of overwhelming to see. And maybe at that point, we would want to generalize with box plots, histograms, KDEs, that sort of thing. So now we're moving into two other types of cat plot that represent the data a little differently than the other cat plots that we've seen so far. So they're still representing categorical data and continuous data, but we're going to use a bar plot and then a point and line plot. They're focused less on showing us the distribution of values and more on showing us where the mean of each category or condition is and the variance we're going to see is variance that's interesting from the perspective of trying to assess whether different conditions are actually statistically different from each other. It's not quite applying statistics, but instead of using the interquartile range and the whiskers representing, you know, the bulk of the data, the sort of min and max values, bar plots and point and line plots show us what are called 95% confidence intervals. So these intervals, they're derived from the, the variance in the data, the standard deviation, but they're basically estimates of we can be 95% confident that the true mean falls within that confidence interval. So whereas the IQR is sort of showing you where 50% of the data are, the 95% confidence intervals are showing you how confident we are based on the distribution of data that we have and the number of data points we have that our mean is a, a fairly accurate representation of the true mean if we collected more data or ran the experiment again. And that's very similar to applying statistics and using a p-value of 0.05, which says we're you know 95% confident this result is not by chance. Slightly different, but conceptually you, you, can, you can look at sort of similarities between them. If the 95% confidence intervals, we call those CIs, uh, if the 95% CIs don't overlap between conditions, you can be pretty confident that they're going to be statistically significantly different if you run statistics. Even if the confidence intervals overlap by, say, like 25%, they're probably going to be statistically different. Okay, so let's look at a bar plot with confidence intervals. So to run this, we do sns.catplot kind equals bar, and then all the rest is the same as the previous plots. So data equals df, x equals condition, y equals rt, and finally plt.show. So there you have it, we have bars for each condition and those little black lines are the 95% confidence intervals. You can see they're quite distinct from each other, not any sort of smidgen of an overlap. So we can be pretty confident that these two reaction time means would be different from each other if we ran statistics. Bar plots can be useful, you see them a lot. They're kind of one of the first kind of graphs we ever learned to uh, draw in, in school, usually. But they're not ideal for a lot of situations. And the reason is that 
they're necessarily anchored to zero. That is, the bar sort of starts at zero and goes up to the mean value. Or if you had a negative value, it would go down. What that means is it's sort of quantifying the difference of each mean from zero. And the area within that bar is basically proportionate to the difference between that mean and zero. That can be relevant if you actually care about how different from zero your measures are. For reaction time, that doesn't make a lot of sense because we know nobody's going to have a reaction time of zero. And really what we want to compare is the difference between the two means, not the differences from zero. So although we can see, yes, non-words have a longer reaction time, the true difference between the conditions is about 0.2, whereas the way that these graphs are shown sort of draws our eyes to the total reaction time value, so kind of 0.6 in one and 0.8 in the other. So not necessarily an ideal way of representing things, especially if zero doesn't have any particular importance or meaning in your particular data set. So for this reason, I like to use point and line plots or just point plots instead of bar plots in most cases. So again, sns.catplot syntax is all the same except the kind equals point. Data is still df. X is still condition and Y is still RT. And plt.show. There you go. So this is what we would call a line plot because we have points for each of the means, 95% confidence intervals, but Seaborn connects the two points with a line. Sometimes that makes sense if there's some sort of relationship between your conditions. So say condition was actually different time points, that might make sense, or something that was sort of a progression over time. Or if you had another variable, you might want, want to represent that as different colors, different points, different lines. But in this case, there's no real sort of, we, we're more concerned about the difference between words and non-words than a line that connects them or sort of the slope of, of that. And so we can very easily remove the line in Seaborn by saying sns.catplot kind equals point, join equals false. So that will tell it not to join the points with a line. And for the heck of it, I can say hue equals condition because you can see here that both conditions are getting the same color, whereas in our previous plots, the two different conditions were automatically being colored differently. Uh, in Seaborn, with line plots by default, because it's going to connect them with a line, it colors them the same. But we can override that by saying hue equals condition, data equals df, rest is the same, sorry, x equals condition. So it's totally fine to say x is condition, so we have condition on the x-axis, and we're also color coding by condition. y equals rt, and finally plt.show. Okay, so now we have the two points without a line connecting them, and you can see this point plot really draws your eyes to what's the mean in each condition, and how different are they based on their confidence intervals. So it's uh, an ideal representation for that sort of thing. All right, so this brings us to the end of our lesson for today. To summarize, Seaborn makes it easy to generate plots that are useful for EDA. RELplot is used for visualizing relationships between two continuous variables. Displot is used for visualizing distributions of data, such as histograms and kernel density estimates. And catplot is used for making comparisons between different levels of categorical data, such as different experimental conditions or groups. Different kinds of cat plot plots vary in how much they communicate information about distributions of data in each category versus how much they communicate about differences between the means of the categories. In EDA, it's often useful to visualize the data many ways to really understand it. So there's no one best choice among all these plots that I've showed you today. But even still, it's important to have an understanding of the strengths and limitations of different kinds of plots. And as a data scientist, you may want to explore your data through generating lots of different plots but at the end of the day, when you go to report your data, you may want to make selections of just a few of those plots. So as really not to overwhelm your reader, or your viewer with too much information and really draw their eye to the features of the data that you most want them to, to focus on. Seaborn makes it relatively easy to generate plots and adjust properties such as color and font size, as well as making plots accessible to the widest range of viewers. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.